Okay, so maybe let's start. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome all to join our APEC Women Leaders Series in FinTech webinar. So we are honored to have this kind of webinar because not only because of today is International Women Day, but it is also a start of a new series of uh, female, female uh, FinTech Leaders Series. Here's the first session. Later on, we'll have another session in June. Uh, later on, we'll tell you more details. But before that, we would like to especially thanks to the partnership of four core organizations to organize today's uh, seminars. First, we have 100 Women in Finance. Uh, so we have invited us, Chair of 100 Women in Finance Tech Committee, Kinsey, uh, to be here. Thank you, Kinsey. And also we have a very core member, Wendy. We are also from 100 Women FinTech Feasibility Committee member. We are also, also another key organizer of the event. And second organizer is FinTech Association of Hong Kong Future Foundation Committee. The committee chair is me, Stefan, and also we have general manager, Raphael. Uh, he will introduce about the FinTech Association later. And third organizer is Singapore FinTech Association, FinTech in Women's Subcommittee. We are honored to have invited Janice Cole, who is the uh, Women in FinTech, uh, FinTech Subcommittee Chair. And lastly, we have FinTech Association of Malaysia, Karen, who is the president of the association to be here as well. So welcome everyone to join this meeting on the International Women's Day. So we want to have at least APEC Women in FinTech Leader Series because we want to have a, firstly, is a cost border uh, to have cost market, including Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong. Maybe in later on, we will invite other country FinTech Association to join together. We wish we become a regular event for women in FinTech leadership, not only single event on today. It will be a regular today. And secondly, we want to have a, each time we will invite the expert in different markets this time we have two speakers, uh, mainly from Hong Kong background, uh, one from Singapore. And next time the host will become the Singapore. So they will introduce their market situation to us as well. So I hope you become a continuous and stable and a regular event. So we, it's not a single topic, it will become a regular event. And lastly, I hope this event will achieve better collaboration among all the parties and cross country uh, FinTech associations. So before we then start, we'd like to in, invite two core, core organizers, uh, FinTech Association of Hong Kong and 100 Women in FinTech Committee to introduce them. So let's invite Raphael, General Manager of FinTech Association of Hong Kong to give a introduction. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. And a warm welcome to all of you uh, listening in today uh, to our webinar that we dubbed uh, APEC Women Leaders in the FinTech Series. Um, and as the name series suggests, and as Stefan mentioned, this is not a one-off, uh, but rather a first of a few more sessions to come together with our um, um, to other, with the other FinTech Association of uh, Malaysia and Singapore and the 100 Women um, uh, in FinTech Organization. Um, as, a, as a GM of the FinTech Association Hong Kong, who is the presenter of this very uh, inaugural session, um, we're, we're very excited to, to be part of this. Uh, please allow me a few words on the FinTech Association itself first. Uh, we are built by the community for the community as, as probably many other fintech associations as well. Um, and we aspire to represent the entire Hong Kong fintech ecosystem, uh, both in Hong Kong as well as uh, abroad uh, in a very inclusive fashion. Our uh, activities circle around, around our three core principles of advocacy, collaboration and education. And the actual work uh, uh, is then done in our eight committees, uh, you know, rec tech, uh, wealth tech, intro tech, digital banking and payments, uh, AI and big data, uh, blockchain, uh, uh, cybersecurity and, 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 and cloud, uh, and future foundation, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the committee that Stefan is, is heading that looks at, um, you know, diversity and inclusion and, and, and talent management. Uh, within our FinTech Association, uh, five of our board members and actually six of our co-chairs are, are women. Uh, and amongst our 1,200 member strong member base, cutting across 350 to 400 corporations, we have multiple women in, in leading positions. Uh, we have startup entrepreneurs, uh, founders of VC firms, CFO of tech companies, uh, or head of strategies at a digital bank, as you will, as you will see and get to know today. Um, so this is a promising situation, um, but certainly 
our industry still has the reputation to be more male represented. And um, hence, we are on a journey to, in, to encourage a more balanced representation. And we want to play our active part in, in showcasing success stories that drive up hopefully the female engagement in our dynamic industry. So yeah, therefore, we're really excited about this series. Um, and what a better day to kick that off than International Women's Day. And uh, you know, not, not as a GM of the FinTech Association, but as a curious, listen, curious listener in today's uh, webinar, I'm, I'm really looking forward to some of the stories of our panelists uh, and to hear their, their struggles on their way to success that I surely will find um, you know, inspiring. And I hope you all will do so too. Um, and with that, you know, I'm handing back and wishing you all a fruitful, engaging, and inspiring webinar. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raphael. And, um, and just from me, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, um, to today. Uh, we've got an exciting lineup of panelists on International Women's Day 2022, so um, very important. Um, 100 Women in Finance and 100 Women in Fintech are really looking forward to the partnership that we we have with the Fintech Associations of Hong Kong, Singapore and uh, Malaysia for this Women Leaders in Fintech series. Um, we, as, as has been said before by Raphael and Stefan, you know, we'll be showcasing female fintech professionals that are having a significant and positive impact on the fintech sector in the APAC region. So really having the opportunity to make them visible, the real sort of female trailblazers in the fintech sector in the APAC region. Um, this is our first event of the year and uh, we will have more to come. So do um, stay tuned. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, 100 Women in Finance is a global organization. Uh, we're committed to gender equity in finance, we're promoting diversity, raising visibility, and empowering women to find their personal path to success. We connect women at every stage of their career, including pre-career, to a global network of people and resources. So for example, I know today in the audience, we've got university students, as well as those that are established finance professionals. And one, at 100 Women in Finance, we're supporting each and every one of you in every step of your careers. <clears throat> As we're all aware in the fintech sector, uh, with its various verticals, it's emerged as a dominant evolutionary theme in both finance and technology industries. And 100 Women in Finance is serving the women leading this growth. So hence, 100 Women in Fintech was born. It is a global visibility project that spotlights senior women in fintech and enhances their connectivity within the fintech ecosystem. It's a really simple concept. I know we've got uh, we've got a slide sort of behind us here, which will sort of show you uh, very shortly where you can access the public directory. So it's a simple concept in that it's a public directory posted on the 100 Women in Finance website. It's um, designed to help conference producers, the media and young women leading role models to easily identify senior female leaders in the FinTech arena. And as chair of 100 Women in FinTech, I'm proud of the growth of the directory to date and the FinTech community that we have also created and the fact that that FinTech community is global as well. Um, so uh, Wendy Wong will be our moderator um, today for the panel, and I'll be handing over to her shortly. She's a member of our directory, and she's also an active committee member, really leading the way with the APAC focus. Um, Career-wise, she's a fintech investor at Allianz and has been a great asset to the digital transformation space from her time at McKinsey. Okay, Wendy, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Kinsey. And uh, we'd love to also bring our today's uh, amazing speakers to the stage. Uh, so Jessica Lam is our um, uh, first speaker, um, is Group Chief Strategy Officer from WeLab, which is also one of the uh, first uh, digital bank here in Hong Kong. And then um, Alice Chen is co-founder from Investor, and also Juni Yen, 
Managing Director of Technology Innovation International uh, from WeBank. Welcome all the three uh, speakers today. So maybe I will just take a round uh, for each one of the panel today and just let them to share a bit about their background. Um, so Alice, do you want to go first? Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all for joining and thank you to all the organizers, 100 Women in Finance, the Hong Kong FinTech Association, um, FinTech Association Malaysia for putting this event together and, and especially Janice from uh, Singapore FinTech Association um, who extended the invitation. Really appreciate um, uh, putting together a, a panel like this on International Women's Day. And I am extremely honored to be sharing a stage with such an esteemed panel of FinTech leaders. Um, so from a, a background perspective, my name is Alice Chen. I am the co-founder and general counsel of InvestaX. InvestaX is a licensed um, platform by the Monetary Authority of Singapore to provide end-to-end -end services for the issuance distribution, investment, and trading of digital securities. And we're positioning our company as a bridge between CFI and DeFi, um, trying to introduce many more concepts from the DeFi world, such as reward tokens, um, to the traditional finance world with concepts such as lending, staking, and borrowing of digital tokens, and allowing people to do more with previously illiquid private market assets. And so um, I'm, I, I am a Chinese born American, having lived uh, the past 16 years in Asia and 10 years in Singapore now. And professionally, I come from a very traditional world of finance, previously um, practicing corporate law, focusing on commercial real estate transactions. And during that time, I could see how real estate was one of the slowest industries to embrace technology. Deeds still being recorded manually, brokers are involved in every real estate transaction, the due diligence management, all of those aspects of real estate were still very antiquated. So when I saw the opportunity to perhaps change that, I, I made the leap. So after over a decade in um, private practice in the US and Asia, um, I, and, you know, investing many years of studying law and taking the bar and being golden handcuffed to the big law salaries, I jumped to the dark side and started my entrepreneurial journey about seven years ago and started my first startup with my husband. And we can get into that a little bit later, but um, we started out as a real estate crowdfunding platform, which was version one of the platform we have today, um, and, and then started incorporating blockchain technology into tokenizing, issuing, and trading of private market assets, including real estate private equity funds, NFTs, and, and, and more. So that's basically a, a very quick and brief intro of myself. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Next one, maybe we can um, 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 invite Jessica to also briefly introduce yourself. Hey guys, uh, Salamat Sore, which means good afternoon. I'm currently in Jakarta. So I've been here for the last month and the whole purpose of this is, Indonesia is not part of this. I know we have Singapore, we have Malaysia and we have Hong Kong. But I think one point is we're all very much interconnected, right? Uh, whether I think some of you are in the UK, some of you are in different parts of the world. And the beauty that's come out of the digital age is we can all be connected and do a webinar, irrespective of where we are in the world. And I think that's one key thing that we want to continue to proliferate and deliver and share with the rest of the aspiring people who want to join fintech or aspiring or curious souls who just want to learn more, right? And so I think that's one of the objectives in terms of what we do. So who am I? I'm Jessica. Um, I run, wear multiple different hats. One of the hats that I wear is I'm actually one of the five female board members on the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, which Raphael just referred to previously. So it's obviously something that we as an organization at WeLab are very committed to, but also for myself. I've been a board member there for three years now. 
Um, so obviously very supportive of doing more in the fintech space. For my day job, I'm a group chief strategy officer for WeLab. We're a Pan-Asian fintech company, uh, primarily focused on consumer finance, um, digital lending, uh, digital technology. But most importantly, three years ago, we opened our first digital bank in Hong Kong, and we're actually well on our way of building a second digital bank in Indonesia right now, licensed digital bank, uh, which is why I'm spending some time here. Uh, which is quite refreshing uh, to see um, how this part of the world has really, really uh, become a lot more digital and, and evolved, particularly in financial services. So I think that's the exciting part in terms of uh, what we're trying to do. My background is not as fascinating as Alice, uh, similar in the sense that I started off in a corporate background, uh, 14 years in investment banking, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore and London. Um, and then decided that I wanted to be bold and be brave and try something a little bit different. And um, WeLab was a perfect landing spot to provide the good mix of having um, a fintech company that has great aspirations, but also with a very, very solid uh, financial background uh, with a view to make a difference in the world and dare to dream and do something different. So right now, I think so far, four and a half years later, the it's paid off, right? You know, we're building a fantastic company, expanding into new markets. Um, I think the team is well over a thousand now. We deal with so many international investors. It's just an absolute blessing and uh, very, very grateful to be here to talk to all of you. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jessica. And then Juni. Okay, uh, thanks, it's my turn. Um, so first is thanks uh, for the Fintech Association for organizing this amazing event. And I think secondly, I want to thank this, all the uh, participants who joined this event, because I know that today there are so many different uh, women's talks, seminars, and then it's you finally to choose this one. I think it's our honor to have you join us. Um, regarding myself, is I'm right now is uh, with VBank to run uh, and build a uh, what we call the tech innovations uh, business, um, and uh, talking about myself is uh, I, I start with uh, like the others is a very conventional uh, start with business consulting and then it's I start to be on uh, technology since year two thousands, uh, running different technology uh, business teams is with different vendors. Um, and across this, all the regions, is MNCs across the different layers. Um, but finally, as I joined WeBank one and a half years ago uh, into a very different companies. Uh, WeBank itself is, is the first uh, digital bank uh, in China since uh, year 2014. And right now, in terms of the business volume, customers, transaction, etc., we have become the uh, largest digital bank globally. Um, I'm very amazed that I, I joined VBank is by the uh, fintech concepts that they have. Is um, so far is they uh, brought very significant impact uh, through the uh, financial inclusions is to the whole China market. Um, basically, what it means is it helps those who can't get banking services that we call the unbanked sectors to get banking services. So in these seven years right now is we serve more than 220 uh, million individuals and more than 1.8 million uh, SMEs so that is they can get loans, financing, banking services from uh, WeBank itself. While in the old days is they can't get any banking services uh, so far from the traditional banks. This helps to improve their life, uh, helps their business. And I remember one of the very interesting and meaningful offering that we had at the beginning of COVID is a lot of SMEs need cash flows and monies. It's they serve a lot is from stopping their business during the COVID time. And we launched a new uh, product and offerings for them is in that 11 days. Uh, for myself, is, although this, I'm not involved in building the banks and the banking business, uh, but I'm more charter is how to bring this amazing technology that can be outside of China's and then is to serve uh, the bigger markets uh, to different industries in the world. Uh, and, and FinTech is a key that we bring in the world. Um, so for today, I look forward that is um, through my navigation through different geography, uh, different layers, different technologies, so that it can share with the audience in here so that we can grow and learn together. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. So my question, after hearing all of you, right, we do have some of you guys like um, Alice in the 
digital investment, wealth tech view with DeFi, this type of space. Jessica in also in digital lending, also in virtual banking space. And also for Juni, you're also in this sort of turning from virtual banking business model to like a B2B business to serve uh, different financial services, right? So my first question is, because given you, you guys' background, also from more like a traditional world, moving to like a fintech space, I would be curious to hear like, definitely we have some challenges you guys gone through. So my question is, what are those challenges you go through when you make those career transition and how you overcome it? Who want to share? Is there any example we can share with us? Um, sure. I mean, I, I, uh, I can go perhaps, um, and kind of just, uh, take you through, um, my process of, you know, thinking when I decided to switch. <laughs> um, so in a way I can, you know, call myself an idealist, always searching for the perfect world. Um, and, you know, as it relates to my professional life, I think, access to finance and financial inclusion, as Junie said, was always something I wanted to promote. Um, and this is kind of where my entrepreneurial journey stems from. Um, and it grew from there to embracing new technologies and pushing boundaries. Um, I think I was still too young to really do something meaningful uh, when Web 1.0 was introduced and, and too focused on building my career to really care about Web 2.0. And now I feel like I have the opportunity and I think we all have the opportunity to, 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 to be at the beginning of Web 3.0 and have the ability to not only participate, but have a major impact in potentially the development of Web 3.0. And this is truly exciting to me and kind of what keeps me going day to day but uh, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not always uh, rosy in the fintech startup life. Um, uh, you know, to answer your questions, there's long hours. Uh, you probably take lower pay compared to the established banks. Um, but, uh, you know, every, I feel as though everything we do has an impact and the feeling of um, truly paving the way or perhaps changing the current way of doing something um, that may have an impact in the future. So it's, it's quite meaningful, but um, it, you know, as every startup knows, um, finance, fi you know, having access to finance is, is extremely important for a startup. And because it is International Women's Day, I do want to highlight um, there is a disparity in funding for female founders and particularly, you know, particularly in fintech, which is one of the few industries that combines two traditionally male dominated fields, finance and technology. <laughs> There's already a, a gap when it comes to those industries and now we're combining those. <laughs> so, um, we struggle with, I think, gender representation in the workplace. Um, retention gaps, funding gaps, and those are all things, as a small fintech, I, I struggle with on a daily basis. So it's, it's real, and um, it's definitely something that we, especially um, from a funding perspective, I mean, you can see all the stats out there, um, you know, the funding gap is, is a major, major obstacle. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Well, maybe I'll just jump in here instead of getting Wendy to moderate. Um, I would, um, you know, I, I, what I would say, there's a couple of, there's two aspects of it, right? I think there's a very practical aspect in which uh, Alice mentioned, which is, you know, it's long hours, it's difficult in terms of what it is. Um, I think there's a lot of hard skills involved, right? You suddenly need to be very open-minded. You need to be able to navigate a lot of things. Typically in a large organization, there's a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot of policy. There's a lot of things that are already there set up for you. Um, in a startup or a fintech, and I, not even a startup, even just as a, a fintech company, as they tend to be newer, tend to be like 
less structured, or even when they're structured, it's more of a hybrid model, and they don't necessarily follow all the bureaucracy or the, the layers of a, you know, 100 year old company, right? In a way, I find that extremely refreshing, because it means that you can actually reinvent and re, you know, recreate what is necessary, as opposed to going through processes just for the sake of it. However, the frustration on the other side is that a lot of times things don't exist. There isn't a policy, right? There isn't a plan. And so you sometimes need to navigate them by yourself. So there are a lot of challenges. So first of all, I would always say, you should know yourself. Are you someone who wants to follow instructions and just have a process and execute? Or are you willing and be able to accept sometimes that there's gonna be bumps in the road? There's gonna be times when you're just gonna have to find a solution. We have a saying as part of our culture book at WeLab, which is always find a way, right? It was, there's a couple of things. One is get shit done. And the other one is always find a way because a lot of the times you just need to hustle, not because of money, not because of resources, but simply because it's never been done before. But you're just gonna have to find a life hack somehow, somewhere and be a little bit more creative. And so I think this comes back down to the most important thing, which is the soft skill and the mindset which is, are you prepared to experiment and do something that's a little bit different? Are you prepared to be a little bit intellectually curious and try something that may be outside of your comfort zone? Will you not be freaked out if you actually have to get comfortable being uncomfortable? When someone tells you something and said, that can't be done, you're like, no, 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 I'm gonna find a hack. You know, And then you're gonna have to work with, whether it's a technical team, whether it's gonna work with a regulator, or whether it's gonna work with you know, a business partner, you're going to have to think outside the conventional ABCD box and maybe go ADC. You're going to do a hybrid of some form. It's, I think that's, that's the biggest, I would say, challenge or shock or realization. However, the achievement or sense of achievement at the end of the day is you have a lot of power ability to actually create something that is actually your contribution, right? It's very direct from a hierarchical perspective. You know, from our organization, whilst we have over a thousand, we have structures, we have business units, but by and large, relative to a large organization, hierarchically, the teams work a lot closer together and everyone gets a voice. Your voice is actually heard. So that to us is you either find it empowering or you find it terrifying. So it really comes down to a personality is, are you suited for this environment? And it's not just a FinTech, non-FinTech thing is, are you suited to company A? Are you better off suited off in company B, C, or D? So, and I think this is a, this is a, you know, there's female tendencies, there's male tendencies, but what I would always say is check yourself before you decide to join any organization. Is this the right fit for you, irrespective of industry, irrespective of anything else. So that's more of a, a generic uh, check before you buy or check before you join. Okay, I see. Um, then, then I do want to share some, some other perspectives. Is, uh, I think what Alice and, and Jess has shared is uh, what kind of company that you will be suitable to work in. And then it's also is the, um, the, the challenges um, and the uh, sweeties as uh, being a startup. Uh, the other perspective I do want to share is um, to, to run a, a FinTech business. Um, sometimes it's like uh, a lot of people will feel that very excited to work in a new FinTech ideas because you're circulated by a group of people that appreciate that new technologies and the cool ideas, etc. cetera. Um, but from my perspective is um, when developing FinTech uh, moving on, then how a fintech can be sustainable is it by the end of the day, it will need to be applied to transform the traditional business in certain cases. Um, and from, from my uh, experience so far is I go through quite a lot of this kind of situations as to bringing the new technologies is back to the uh, conventional business and then how to help them to transform. And if that part, you will not be circulated by those very cool people that will say the same song with you that this is a new, a good technology, et cetera. Um, but if you can be successfully using this new fintech to transform the old world, then that will make the technology even much more sustainable. Um, so from that perspective, what I do want to uh, share with the audience in here is, um, how you can help all these conventional, say, banks, 
uh, financial institutions, etc., is to more embrace the new ideas and then is how to build their uh, organizations, cultures and mindsets is to be more agile. Then that will need the patience, a lot of creativity uh, along along that. And also is on the other um, on the other aspects of it is the um, buy-in of the regulators as well. Um, because it's, we, when we talk about fintech, a lot of financial industries are, that are be, they're being uh, regulated. Um, and whether a new fintech solutions can be applied into that organization, it will need the blessing or the endorsements from the regulators as well. Um, so how to engage and socialize with the regulators so that they can get the buy-in, and then it's for your new fintech solutions that can be applied into the uh, traditional world or in this regulated industries, I, I think that's all important as well. Um, so one of the very key skills in addition to patience and also is the change management mindset, et cetera, uh, I think communication skills will be very important. It's not just to bring your fintechs to the business owners, it's how you can help the business owners is on the communications of the fintechs is across the different functions, even including operations, compliance, security, and all that, and even regulators is to get the buy-in so that we can bring the new thing back to the traditional world and then is to achieve the transformations. Um, I think that part is, um, is also a very valuable experience. Um, and in addition to the cool part, uh, that part will also be important for everybody to embrace. Uh, that's, that's I do want to share. Mm -mm. Good. So I found that's very amazing to, to hear, like, uh, we even moving to fintech world is also have different perspective of how we want to make this decision, right? Check the, your, your interests and whether it fits to the organization, etc. It's also not just a fintech company you need it, but also when you move your career, you also need to consider it. My question to Alice, because you're a little bit different because you're more is on the, enter, the entrepreneurial journey. You build your own company, right? Your startup. So it would be also interesting interesting to know when you've gone through this journey of not being like a part of the company as employee right you build your own company how you gone through this journey and what are the the things that you think would be the most remarkable right um in this uh in this experience sure um i think i can only speak from my own personal perspective and this may not fit everyone's entrepreneurial journey. I mean, I, I did stay at earlier um, at the beginning that I started this with my husband. So that in itself creates complications. Um, but we come from very different uh, backgrounds, whereas I come from a very traditional kind of process flow oriented um, industry, especially in legal, lots of regulatory, public policy, um, communication skills. Um, and my husband, a serial entrepreneur, wants to just push boundaries. So we often clashed, um, but it's also good in a sense where we could meet in the middle and find the balance. And for me personally, I think I couldn't do this as a sole founder. And it was important for me to have a co-founder to bounce ideas off of, although we d could disagree all the time, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, it, we, when, when, you know, talking about inclusion and diversity, the more diverse um, your management team, um, executive team, the better, I think, ideas and, and company will, will come out of it. And so, as a company, we, we definitely try to walk the talk um, and, and you know, uh, um, really instill that across the board. So what we found, um, just a natural kind of filtering or um, of, of people that shared the same values as, as us and same strategies. And, and I think, most, it was just a natural filtering process. I think over time, as um, the company grew, um, people who shared the same vision, uh, work ethic stayed. And those that didn't, and, and I think it goes back to Jessica's point about be honest with yourself 
um, and your personality? Is it the right fit for you? Um, and I, I, you know, go back to my days in law school, and I remember a adjunct professor came in and said, you know, I think you're just either born uh, with the entrepreneurial spirit or not. And I can now personally say I thought I'd never had it in me, right? And I ne the fintech and technology not on my radar at all. But today I'm fully immersed in it and I'm, I'm, I'm running a company. Um, we have about 40 something people in the company ranging from tech to compliance to um, you know, uh, legal and regulatory and we communicate with the regulators constantly um, as, as a licensed, um, uh, licensed platform. So that, uh, you know, it, you, you just have to ask yourself that question. And, and now looking back to his comment, I would fully disagree. So if you think, you know, if you're thinking about a potential career change mid career, uh, and, but you've been told something similar, I would, I would, you know, I would question that. I don't think you're born an entrepreneur. You could potentially have followed a different path, but realize actually, I do have my own passions, my own pursuits, and this is what gets me excited uh, on a daily basis. And then, and then, and then very happily fit into that journey. Um, so, that, you know, I, I don't know if I really answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. Um, and also I found like Jessica and, and Junie, please also jump in. I mean, uh, it's also interesting when when you go through from like Jessica is also from like investment banking moving to to the to to WeLab and Junie is from technology side, moved to um, WeBank. What you also see particular when when you move to this space and be become like a senior management, right, of this organization, male-dominated, tech, savvy, digital savvy um, um, colleagues around you, how, um, how you also position yourself, right, in this uh, sort of setting? Um, do you want to take it first, Ginny, since I've... <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think quite a lot of us, if, if people that uh, you will keep moving on on the new role, um, then I think it's a very one, one very fundamental thing that always play with me. I, I believe that that happens for the others as well is uh, when you move on the new role, the first questions that you always will ask is um, the articulation of the successful models for the business that you're going to run. I think that's very important because it's, if you cannot articulate what that successful business model will be, then basically you lose the overall directions as to guide your team, uh, to guide all the actions and strategy, et cetera. Um, I, I think that to me is a very important. Um, and because it's with that, then you will know that, okay, in terms of what kind of business, what we call typically call the right battle to pick to fight, uh, and then it's what kind of opportunities that you should target at, what type of team that you need to build up, what kind of incentives you need to design, uh, and then it's what kind of external ecosystem partnership that you need to build, et cetera. It's all the focuses around this will be oriented to the first fundamental questions that I talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think another thing which will be uh, very, very important, especially is when all of us that appreciate to work in these kind of like evolving new technology because of fintech all of this, then it will end, it, it always will happen that is, when talking about a right articulations, no one will get the, the, the full pictures of it. The means is there will not be one single leader that will articulate this uh, successful business model right away because as you want to tap into the knowledge, perspective, creativity of your team members, of the others. So it's an articulation of a team together instead of a top-down articulation. Because I, I always believe that if a top-down articulations from no matter a startup ideas of a new technology, unless that top-down ideas is coming from a top, top, top guru. Otherwise, <laughs> it might not fly. And the team 
will just follow instead of they proactively to uh, to contribute. Um, so I think that is how uh, we can encourage a team to join the articulation of the successful models together. Uh, I think that is very, very important is to unleash the uh, synergy is from the team. Um, but when I hear when uh, Alice share her perspective, uh, that one very strong message that comes to my mind that resonates with me is this, is no matter if it's work on a startup, uh, we run a new business or take up a new role. Uh, I think the key question to start with is what we can make it to happen mm -hmm. instead of sometimes you come across people, the first question that comes to mind is why they can't do it. I think it will make a very big difference if we start with what we can do instead of why we can't do it. Uh, I think it will help a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Let me let me chime in. Um, I think in terms of, you know, from the industries that you talked about, you know, male dominated or not, it's really how you how you make of it. Right. I think stereotypes are stereotypes are there for a reason. But this all comes down to the individuals and how you manage and position and posture yourself. Right. Being surrounded with, I think, like minded people or people who you feel like it's easy to communicate with and you have the ability and freedom to be able to express your views, but also that comes down to you as well, right? It's not just about the environment. It's also about, are you, you gotta be true to yourself, right? If you have a view and you wanna share it, you need to express it. Do you need to be the entrepreneur as Alice is, or can you just have an entrepreneurial mind, right? And be able to express it in a slightly different environment. Again, part of it comes to opportunity, but the other part of it just comes down to your environment and how you want to pick and choose. I agree with Alice. I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur and I'm not an entrepreneur right now, but I am of a very entrepreneurial job and I have a very entrepreneurial role in an organization where and the leadership level, we have very strong influence without being said entrepreneur and co-founder, right? But that is what I enjoy and that's what I'm comfortable with. You know, but I think Alice has probably grown into her role as the co-founder, but, you know, it's, it's not something she set out to do, but obviously has very successfully navigated it. But I think that is also very important for yourself and also comes down to the structure of your organization and the people around you uh, in terms of what works and what doesn't work. People always joke and say, you should read the room. Yeah, you should read the audience. You should read who your peers are, who your partners are. Does this make sense? does this not make sense to do so. I think what Jeannie said in terms of you should have an alignment on the North Star, you should know where you're trying to get to at the end of the day. If your objective is financial inclusion and that is the goal, there are many ways to resolve or, or make inroads into financial inclusion, right? So how, how are you skinning this cat at the end of the day, knowing that you have a goal in mind, right? I think that is very important to always remind the team in terms of what are we trying to do ultimately in the day? Is it going this way? Is it going this way? You know, or maybe it isn't going that way at all. Um, so I, I believe that that is definitely something that's quite important. But how you navigate is really your own call. Right. You can listen to these seminars, talk to people who've done it before. I bounce off ideas off mentors, you know, people who've been there, hey, I've been in this situation. Hey, what do you think? Just so I wanna, you know, let me just run this by you, give me some views. I'm happy to be proven wrong, happy to be said, oh, it's not a bad idea. Make a lot of friends, make a lot of mentors. That is always going to be my suggestion. You know, um, growing up, we don't know everything. Regulators don't know everything right? Your boss doesn't know everything, right? Your colleagues doesn't know everything. So it is really, it's a 360 process. You know, everyone's uh, someone you can bounce an idea off. And at the end of the day, I mean, for us, we do a B2C and a B2B business, right? You need to know what your customers want ultimately, right? As Junie mentioned, when it's a B2B customer, it's a slightly different demographic. They may not be as tech-minded as you, so you got to speak their language and communicate in a way that they're comfortable with. If my B2C customers are millennials, right, or gen, whatever they are these days, I have no clue what they want, right? I need to talk to people who actually do, right? So don't pretend to be them because you're not, right? And so it's always know your audience, know what they want, and, and do what you need to do to be able to understand them appropriately. I think misrepresentation is always um, one of the biggest fallacies and flaws where you think you know what you're doing, but actually, you know, you're not really 
delivering what the customer wants at the end of the day. So I think there's many, many levels and, and, and different, you know, fractions of how we can look at this. Um, but at the end of the day, always take a step back and say, what's your North Star? Where are you trying to get to? You know, is this aligned? And is this me? Is this Jessica Lamb? Is this what I want to achieve at the end of the day? Because if it's not something you're comfortable with, you might be very talented and able to navigate it every day. But when you go to work, you're not going to enjoy it and you're not going to be happy. Um, to me, you know, work is like a second family. We spend so much time there. We're so invested, you know, in what we do. Um, if, if I didn't enjoy, you know, as, as like a second family and if we didn't treat each other that way, it's just a job. It's a nine to five job. It's not a career. It's not a passion. Um, so again, check yourself, ask yourself these questions. Um, and yeah, I want to open up the floor and see if anyone else has anything to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for all of you guys sharing. And um, just wondering, Stefan, um, uh, is there any questions? But uh, feel free to to um, to jump in any questions, and then uh, we will have uh, still around five or seven minutes, or we can do the Q and A section. Oh yes, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I have connected quite a lot of questions. I try to summarize into two main categories to the the time. The first one is about the leadership. Uh, so basically the question is about in view of the prolonged pandemic, the change in regulation, and now we have a new work from home of remote working, uh, new phenomenon, travel restriction, and global uncertainty. What quality that the future leader need to have if they want to feel success in the market? Okay, so first question. And the second question is related to people management. Um, what do you say about the future development of the APEC fintech markets, especially in terms of the tenant shortage, uh, the manpower shortage problem? How do you manage the tenant differently as compared to your previous industry? And uh, as a leader, how should we then prepare to uh, manage the so called uh, fintech staff? I'll take, I can take the work from home one and someone else can take the other one. I think <laughs> culturally, what I would say is um, we've had to adapt. I will, I will say this in the very beginning. Um, you know, we're not fans from work from home because I think in the very beginning, we're like, oh, you know, we, we like people. We like our colleagues. We like talking to each other. We like see we're, we're humans for a reason. Right. You know, interaction is actually very important. Um, and I think that's how we were trained for many, many years. Um, not to mention, oh, can't work from home. There's kids, there's cats, there's whatever, you know, the, the ton of reasons. It's hilarious, actually. You know, you see cats strolling across, you know. It is what it is. Everyone's situation is a little bit different. Um, so I think it was a little bit mixed in terms of those who would prefer to work from home and those who prefer to see each other. I think initially it was an overwhelming, you know, 80% prefer to be in the office. And I think as time went on, these numbers started to switch a little bit. Um, the reality is, is, this is what it's going to be, right, in the near term, and particularly in Hong Kong. Um, so it will be work from home. So I think everyone just needs to get comfortable being uncomfortable um, and finding a way um, in terms of what it is. Because at the end of the day, the well-being of our employees and our team is of most importance, right? Health in terms of where they are um, and what matters to them. And even at that point in time, um, we had to listen to our employees, listen to our team. Hey, if you're having concerns, or for whatever reason, you know, come talk to us separately. We have firm-wide policies, but we also are humans that where we can talk to our team and understand their situation. And I think compassion, empathy is super important, right? Rather than having rules, right? This is not coding where you need to put a straight rule, right? You know, go straight, if not do that. No, 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 there's empathy in this. And so I think at the end of the day, even as a tech organization, we always say it's human-led but machine-assisted. Machines make it a lot more efficient and effective where necessary, but there is human intervention and empathy required on making these decisions. However, we're always open-minded in terms of what are the different little things we can do to make our team more comfortable. Um, so recent, so we do a lot of Zoom happy hours. Some are forced, some are voluntary. Um, I'm a big fan of Zoom happy hours. Uh, we also do Zoom team lunches and send the team uh, Food Panda vouchers. Unfortunately, now even Food Panda is not available because of delivery uh, concerns, but the thought was there and the vouchers have gone out, but haven't been able to execute. Um, but it's also supporting businesses, right? 
because we need to make sure that businesses continue to operate um, and the economy continues to, you know, uh, thrive in, in different ways. So I think every or I've heard some other organizations, you know, giving stipends for buying masks or or so on and so forth. I think every organization has their own way of doing their part. Uh, for us, we like human interaction, and so therefore, uh, Zoom lunches or Zoom happy hours are. Are, are popular <laughs> because we get to see each other and talk. Um, but I think it's just, uh, again, knowing your people, knowing your team and, and seeing what matters. Uh, in the very beginning, we, when it was still safe, we did care packages, you know, the Exco team came in to pack masks, sanitizers, when, when masks were hard to buy, you know, sanitizers, like throat drops, et cetera, and all those things. And, and literally us, the CEO, we were all in there at like 6 a.m., like stuffing bags and, you know, handing off to people. I think it's a little gestures that count. Um, so yeah, to each their own, but it's something that we feel is very, very important. Um, actions more than just words, because um, we do care, but at the end of the day, we, we, we want to do something that matters and uh, work from home, if that's the best way. We've, we've, we've sent monitors home to people you know, laptop stands, you know, all these different things, whatever we can do to make your life more comfortable. Um, so yeah, we're trying our best here. Um, and I'm working out of a hotel now. And, you know, I'm just as comfortable as if I was working at home. So <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, if okay. I can maybe add a, a couple sentences to what Jessica said as well. I think the question also re uh, was asking what skill sets are relevant or important, right? In from working from home, I think, um, being tech savvy, <laughs> you know, we're all day long in front of the computer. So, you know, um, I, I say inclusion starts with I, meaning it starts at home, it starts at the workplace. I've got my daughter, she's six years old, um, doing coding classes now, <laughs> right? Because I know this is going to be the future. It's it, whether it's part time or, or full time, it's here to stay, I think. Um, as a policy for our company, um, we have a, a default rule that you can work from home. Um, but being a regulated entity, there's also a lot of cybersecurity risk. Um, <laughs> Singapore, you know, the whole technology risk management framework that we have to comply with, and it's very extensive. So um, being tech savvy, cybersecurity aware, um, you know, and, and just all of these other things, disaster recovery, all of these other things that you need to be aware of um, as a licensed financial institution is, is important. Um, and I think, you know, to, to add on to what Jessica said, mental and physical health, especially now, is critical. Um, we did something similar at our company during, um, you know, th this whole COVID time where we had Friday lunches, um, games, care packages for winners and, and things like that. So we tried, um, but being very dispersed to begin with, we've got developers in Ukraine, Russia, um, and they're, they're going through some challenging times right now. Um, and a lot of them are having to relocate because of the war at the moment, but we've got developers in India, um, Vietnam, Philippines. So we were already dispersed to begin with and um, having to make sure uh, that they are mentally and physically looked after um, is very important um, given there is that lack of human interaction. So it's still things uh, we're trying to improve on and always looking at ways to, to improve everyone's mental health. But I, I just, yeah, want to emphasize this is critical. Even I feel the fatigue <laughs> and I, I can still see some of my colleagues from day to day, but um, yeah, I definitely feel the fatigue being in front of the, the, the screen all day long. I see. But maybe I just share very quickly uh, regarding the second question on the talents. And I know that we are running out of time and I saw so many questions. I don't know how many questions. Yeah. So regard, regarding the talent question, I think it's a, it's a very good question because it's, I think nowadays is we, in Asia, we, we suffer from, from that one. Uh, people's turnover uh, and then it's especially in the new field that everybody try to compete for the talents together. Um, so, so even for myself, is right now the way that I run the talents versus in, let's like, say, five, ten years ago is it is very different. 
because in the old days you you can try to talk about retention. Right now, frankly speaking, retention is not that realistic. People keep changing jobs, especially for the young talents, right? Um, so to me, right now, the two things that hopefully can can uh, work for you, um, at least that works for me. First is I think uh, you will need spend more efforts than the than the past. That is to build your talents pipeline. Even though this you don't have headcount to hire now. But keeping your network to build your talent pipeline so that is whenever you need people, you can have people to you, you can have options and candidates to fill. I think that is very, very important. Um, and secondly, is um, I think COVID did help on the other perspective that people quite get used to work virtually together. Um, so in the past, we might try to build a team that physically locates together, that they can work together. Uh, but right now, uh, we can explore more options as to build up virtual team. Of course, as I'm not, I would not suggest that you have one people in one location, one people in another location, so that uh, people will feel very distant uh, from, from a team synergy perspective. Um, but I think uh, if you can have chances to build a couple of people in and other locations, but work across as a virtual teams together, that sometimes can help to relieve the uh, talent problems because it's some sometimes it's geographically um, or situational so scarcity. Um, so so that is some tactics that might help you on on that talent question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think on the talent thing, I think it really comes down to how your organization is structured. Right. And it comes down to your leader. Is your leader a person who is a very warm, emotional, warm, fuzzy person who always wants to team together? No, because there's very different types of leaders. Right. Yes. Or there's more of a you have this thing, you do it, we do it. You know, we don't have. And, and, and I think it works for different people in terms of the type of, you know, management structure or, or the team structure and dynamics. And it also depends on your size and the type of industry you're in. I think Alice makes a good point. Regulated industries in which all three of us are in is very different from running and you know industries that are less regulated where you can be a lot more creative in terms of what you do like social media for example right and then i think the types of talent and the demographics of people you bring in for a regulated industry typically need to be a little bit more experienced because of that barrier whereas i do think you know um some other industries, you actually can have a much younger, you know, less experienced, but more creative crowd. So I think, you know, there's so many different variables um, in terms of how to look at this. So there is no one size fits all. I think what Jeannie said makes a lot of sense for a particular type of organization and, you know, different types of entrepreneurs. You know, some are the jeans and hoodie type and some are, you know, some still wear shirts and suits, even though they don't have to because, you know, that's their habit. So, you know, I think it's a it's it's a process, right? And and what I can say is, I see my founder in the before pandemic suits and ties every single day. When the pandemic started, so the C-suite all started coming in in t-shirts because I'm like, I need to dry clean my clothes every day. I'm not dry cleaning my suits, right, or my or my dresses. So I started doing hoods, t-shirts, and and you know the yoga pants basically. And now I think as more of us are transforming, he started coming in jeans and like polo shirt because. <laughs> The whole team started to do that. And when your leadership starts to do that, the team will be more comfortable. So sometimes COVID does actually shift some of that evolution um, and gets people more comfortable. And when you go see another client, they won't be as judgy when you're not in a suit because of COVID. So um, I do think it depends on sometimes the team around you to make these calls, um, as silly as it is in terms of dress code. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone sharing. I see uh, we allow over one for five minutes. So maybe at the, be at the end, okay, we might all the speaker could keep, um, we have over uh, 50 or 60 audience today. So maybe do you have a one line of takeaway message for the audience? Yeah, I can go first. I'll just be really quick. I, I think at the end of the day, um, this is what I call a see it be it moment, which mm -hmm. is you see different people you know, sharing their their perspectives, right? If this is a moment where you see someone, you're like, hey, that could be me, or hey, that is someone I don't want to be. I think regardless of the outcome, that's a good thing, right? Because that is a see it, I don't want to be it, or see it, I want to be that person. And I think it's it's something that's realistic for me in the future. Then I think we've done our part in terms of um, 
you know, sharing some message or either inspiring or not inspiring other people, I think that is actually very, very important. Um, but be brave, you know, uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there. The world is very challenging, but you will be able to navigate it. You're not alone. Hmm, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think very similar messaging in that I would say, you know, seize the opportunity. Um, and instead of looking at new technologies or new careers as a threat, perhaps embrace it to, to become one of the early adopters and, and really um, fulfill something that you, you that would satisfy you, but also potentially have a legacy impact. Um, this is what why you know I got into the space that I got into. Um, and you know it, 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 ask yourself is this what what you're doing today? Is it really fulfilling you? Is it or is it just a nine to five job like Jessica said? <laughs> so um, yeah. Um, my my key takeaway for all will be is uh, if you believe in FinTech, think of something that it can make things impossible to become possible. Mm -mm. Mm. Is it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Very good message. Thank you all. Uh, thank you again for Wendy uh, to become a facilitator. And also thank you uh, all the speaker, Jessica, Alice, and Julie for today's sharing. So time now is uh, almost uh, six ten. Okay, so we might uh, everyone you, you could uh, turn on your screen so we could have take a group picture together. Ah. Oh yeah, so many people here. Great. Ah. Great to do that. Wow, wow. So uh, Justin also helped me to take picture of other pages. Okay. Uh, I have a suggestion. Are you going to do the break the bias? Oh, yeah. French National Women's Day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So one, uh, okay. Okay. I, I, I can't, I don't have hand to do it. Okay, so other could do that. <laughs> one. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay. One, one, one. Okay. Three, two, one. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Okay. So uh, later on, we'll send you the message uh, to let you know our future events. Uh, Next one, COP probably will become June. Uh, we, we will be hosted by Singapore Fintech Association. Looking forward to our next series. Thank you all. Bye. All right. Guys, Bye. Everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.